Well, in the aftermath of, of Hurricane Katrina, a helicopter pilot by the name of Ian McConnell said that he was told to keep five H-60 helicopters in the air, around the clock, rescuing people from their homes, many from the, res- from the rooftop of their homes. And he said that the first three times, the first trip, three missions they went out on, they rescued a number of people, including even dogs and a cat. He said on the fourth mission, though, in fact, he said the first three missions they rescued like 90 people. But he said the, the fourth mission they went on, no one wanted to be rescued. And they would, they would say, you know, just send us some food and water. And they would tell them, look, the water's going to stay up for a while. You're going to be there for a while. But nonetheless, they said people kept refusing to be rescued. <laughs> I thought as I read that story, I thought there are many unbelievers who have the same posture when it comes to Christ, right? They, they, the only rescue that they have is Christ, but they defer not to. But for the believer who has trusted Christ... The believer, those believers that we know, should know, should understand that God is a God who delivers. God is a God of salvation. The word salvation, soteria in the Greek, means at its root meaning, means deliverance, preservation. So God is a God who delivers. And that's what happens when we trust Christ. He delivers us, not only from the penalty of sin and the judgment that is to come, for those who, who, who resist Christ, but also he delivers us daily in our Christian life. As someone has said, the, the grace that saved us is the same grace that sustains us and delivers us every day in the life of the believer. Well, the Apostle Paul often prayed for that. I mean, what, he said in Philippians chapter 1, he says, For I know that this will re- turn out for my deliverance through your prayers and the provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. And of course, David uh, was no stranger to praying for deliverance. He prayed in Psalm 34, the righteous cry, and the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. I mean, so often, is that not the cry of the heart of the believer? I mean, how many of us have not? I dare say, no believer has not been at any place at some point in their life in which they said, God, deliver me from this. And many times we cry out, God, why is this continuing to go on? Nonetheless, God is the God who delivers. Well, we've been walking through the book of Esther. It's been a profound journey as we've seen God's providential hand at work Even though the name of God is not used in the book, nonetheless, the providential hand is without question evident in that book. God provided deliverance for Esther as well as for Mordecai, two Jewish people. And for that reason and more, that's that's why this book is so relevant to our lives. So we'll come down to the last two messages of, of this book, but nonetheless, it's, it's a great book, a great reminder that God is a God who delivers, and we see that today in this chapter. And I, I think sometimes the question that I get over and over is, well, what does it look like when God delivers? If he does deliver, what does that look like? Well, today we see some of what it looks like when God is in the business of delivering. Let's turn to Esther chapter 9. Chapter 9, Esther, right after Nehemiah, right before the book of Job. Now, it's been two weeks since we've been in the book of Esther, so let's backtrack just a bit. Remember, the villain Haman, who is Haman? Haman was the second in command to King Xerxes or King Ahasuerus, right? And what happened? He deceived the king, tricked the king into basically writing uh, edict that would exterminate the Jewish people, the Hebrew people, right? And so Mordecai, a Jew, the cousin of Esther, gets wind of this, and he goes directly to Esther, and he says, Esther, you've got to do something. And so remember, now, Esther was raised by Mordecai. I happen, happen to believe that, uh, personally, I believe that Mordecai, though he's her cousin, 
I have to believe that he's a bit older than her. Esther, probably when she became queen, was no older than 21. So by this time, she's about 24, 25, at, at most probably. But Mordecai kind of reminds me of, of an uncle that kind of, you know, I had uh, four uncles on my mother's side and five uncles on my father's side. And so they were always, most of them were always very fatherly to me. Uh, so I, I kind of think Mordecai was kind of like that. And so he goes to Esther and he tells Esther, look, you got to do something about this. Now, remember, at this point, the king, who's married to the queen Esther, did not know that she was a Jew. But Mordecai says, you got to, look, don't think that you'll be, you'll be rescued or that you won't die just being a queen. You're a Jew also. And so at this point, the king, she goes to the king uh, but let me back up just a bit. Before this, she, of course, the king put an edict. He listened to Haman, did what he said, what his request was, and put this into effect. Now, in the laws of the, Jew, of the Persians, the Medes and the Persians, once an edict, once a law was put in place, it could not be reversed. That's just the way you, you can check out Daniel chapter 6. At Daniel chapter 6, you'll see that it, there are a couple of references to the fact that a law with the Persians, once it's in place, cannot be um, revoked. So all the king could do at this point is to put another law in its place, or put not in its place, but put another law that would kind of soften that. And so what did the king do? He, he put a law, law in place that favored the Jews and said that the Jews would have the right to defend themselves. Now, let's begin reading in verses Verse 1, going through verse 4. Again, now in the twelfth month, this is the month of Adar, or Adar, depending on how you want to pronounce that Hebrew word. On the thirteenth day, when the uh, king's command and edict were about to be executed. On the days when the enemies of the Jews hoped to gain the mastery over them, it was turned to the contrary. The table was turned, is really the literal Hebrew here was turned to the contrary so that the Jews themselves gained the mastery over those who hated them. The Jews assembled in their cities throughout all the provinces of King Ahasuerus to lay hands on those who sought their harm. No one could stand before them, for the dread of them had fallen on all the peoples. Even all the princes of the provinces, the satraps, the governors, and those who were doing the king's business assisted the Jews because the dread of Mordecai had fallen on them. And then verse 4, Indeed, Mordecai was great in the king's house, and his fame spread throughout all the provinces, for the man Mordecai became, now watch that, greater and greater. Verse 1 really provides an overview of the events of this chapter. Verse 2 provides additional details of the killing that took place after these edicts. For example, in verse 2, the emphasis, uh, verse 2 emphasizes that the Jews prepared to lay hands on those who would seek to bring harm to them. In other words, they did not randomly attack whomever they pleased, but they, they fought defensively, even though the edict sign allowed them to do much more than that. The Jewish men were organized, they were armed, they were ready to confront the, any enemy who would attack them. But the Lord gave them a greater weapon, if you didn't notice in the text. It says, because the dread or the fear of the Jews fell upon them. Now what was this? This was the fear that God had sent into the hearts of the Gentiles to keep them from fighting the Jews. This reminds us, of course, of the experience of Jacob. Remember Jacob uh, in Genesis 35 when he went from Shechem to Bethel, it says in 35, chapter 35, as they journeyed, there was a great terror upon the cities which were around them, and they did not pursue the sons of Jacob. It was also the same fear that went before Israel as they entered the promised land. In Deuteronomy chapter 2, it says, This day I will begin to put the dread and fear of you upon the peoples everywhere under the heavens, who when they hear the report of you will tremble and be in anguish because of you. We also read in Joshua that Rahab told the two Jews, Jewish spies, 
uh, of the fear of Israel, and that that fear had paralyzed the people in Canaan, and that fear helped them have victory. But there's another aspect of this fear that we need to note as well. It's in verse 3, and it says, that was the fear of, say it, look at it, Mordecai. The princes, the deputies, the governors, the officers of the king throughout the empire were in such awe of Mordecai that they even helped the Jews defend themselves against the other people in the Persian empire. God had given Mordecai position, the highest position under the king. He had exalted him, and the people even feared Mordecai. Now, God put that in their hearts. How do you know? And what I would say here is that about Mordecai, that we, we've seen this before, but it's worth noting, Mordecai had this heart that was humble and that was pure. He had a pure motive. You never see Mordecai in spite of the mistreatment that he got. Remember, Mordecai was the one who spilled the beans about the plot against the king. He saved the king's life. And nonetheless, it wasn't until a few years later that he was rewarded for that. But he never became bitter. And you don't see that even in all of this. You don't see that he's bitter against the, the, the people who want to take the life or the lives of the Jewish people. Clearly, God had exalted this man beyond measure. So here's how do we, what does God's deliverance of his children look like? Well, here's the first thing I would suggest. He exalts the pure and humble in heart. Pure motive, mind you, and humble in heart. I want you to hold your place and go with me to James chapter 4. James chapter 4. And join me at verse 6 of James chapter 4. James is what I call your, the, the in-your-face apostle. He was really right, very direct. And he says, but he gives, in verse 6, he says, but he gives greater grace, therefore, it says, God is opposed to the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Submit, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will cleanse, uh, he will draw near to you, I should say. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be miserable, and mourn, and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning in your joy to gloom. Now here's the verse. Humble yourself in the presence of the Lord and he will exalt you. Humble yourself in the presence of the Lord and he will what? Exalt you. Mordecai like David, who, was a, who had a pure heart as a shepherd, was exalted. Like Joseph, who had a pure heart, who was exalted. And even like Daniel, who had a pure heart, who was exalted as well. God calls upon us as we walk with him, and it's, it's easy as we begin to get more knowledge of God's word, get more, do more things for the Lord. It's easy to fall into that trap of, of pride. But here's Mordecai, who never became bitter, who never became hostile, who never became prideful, who had a pure motive. And God, what did God do? He exalted him in due time. You may find yourself in a place where you think, well, why am I here? I, I deserve to be in a, a bigger place, a better place. And God says, wait. I'll exalt you if you need to be exalted, if your heart's pure. Now, <laughs> let's read on. It says, then the Jews struck all their enemies, in verse 5, with the sword, killing and destroying. They did what they pleased to those who hated them. And at the citadel of Susa, the Jews killed and destroyed 500. And Parshantatha, Dalphon, Aspatha, Poratha, Adaliah, Eridea, Eridatha, Parmeshtha, Arisai, Eridai and Viztha. Now you, any of you who are pre preparing to have another child, here are some names that you perhaps can use uh, if you think about. <laughs> Nonetheless, in verse 10, it says, the ten sons of Haman, the son of Hamadatha, 
the Jew, Jews' enemy, but they did not lay their hands on the plunder. On that day, the number of those who were killed at the citadel in Susa was reported to the king. Um, now, verse 5, if you look at verse 5, go back and look at verse 5, it elaborates upon the Jews' victory, adding that they did what they pleased with those who hated them. Now, that's an interesting phrase because it's become a controversial phrase by commentators. Uh, in fact, in the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, you've heard me talk about that, that particular phrase is not even in there. Now, remember, the Septuagint is not inspired, though it was interpreted by 72 uh, Jewish scholars, and it's a very, re a very respected translation. In fact, uh, Jesus quoted often out of the Septuagint from the Greek translation. So did Paul. Nonetheless, though, there are some commentators who say that that statement implies that the Jews did more than defend themselves, that they took up their own vengeance. I think not for a couple or more reasons. First, the Edict of Mordecai only allowed them to fight if they were attacked. Secondly, in verse 11, it states that they did not lay their hands on the plunder. The fact that they, get this, the fact that the Jews did not take the goods of those whom they killed in self-defense underscores the integrity of their motivation. The Edict of the King said you could do more than that, but they did not. And thirdly, I think the phrase could simply mean that God had so provided supernatural power to put to death those who came up against them. And I think there's no doubt that he provided supernatural power here. Let me illustrate it this way. Sometimes, uh, it, this is football season, right? So sometimes you watch, you watch football and sometimes you, you flip from one channel to the next and you'll see one team that's just outmatched, just completely outmatched. And one team will just push them around and score touchdown after touchdown and so forth. And, and someone would say, this team, this team had their way with this team, the weak team. Someone could say, also, they did what they pleased, what the, whatever they wished to do. That's the idea, I think, in this context. There's no doubt that God gave the Jews supernatural strength to defend themselves and even kill those who wish to exterminate the Hebrew people, people like Haman, people like his sons. You remember the story of Elisha? Remember Elisha and his, his servant in this tent looks out of his tent and he sees them surrounded by the armies of Syria. Now, Elisha had been reading the king's mail particularly, and he was always in the face of the king, so the king sends out his army. And, and so the servant looks out, and he sees them surrounded, all, as far as he could see, and he runs back to Elisha, and he says, wake up, Elisha, we're surrounded, we're surrounded. <laughs> and I can just picture Elisha kind of yawning and saying, uh, no, greater are those that are with us than those that are what? Against us. And, you know, the servant by this time is thinking, What's wrong with this guy? He's been, his, his brain is baked. He's been in the sun too long. But the text says that Elisha prayed that God would open his eyes. And what did he see? <laughs> Armies and chariots of what? By the way, I love that movie. Uh, see, uh, Colonel J.K. McMahon was a man that Debbie and I knew well. Uh, we knew him well because we, when we were in college, we went to Bible, stu uh, Bible study at his home. Colonel McMahon, was, by this time, was a retired colonel, and he had flown jets. And he told me this story, and I would not have believed this story had anybody else told me this, but McMahon, Dr. Colonel McMahon uh, was a wonderful brother in Christ, and, and I, he didn't exaggerate, if anything. He said, we were talking about the Six-Day War, in, in 67, I believe it was, when Israel was basically taking back their land that God had promised them. And he said that he heard this from a Jewish pilot, fellow pilot. He said, he said that the Syrian army soldiers said 
that when they were in a particular place in a particular time, that they saw hundreds of tanks, Israel tanks. The Jewish officers said, number one, we don't have a hundred ta- tanks. So number two, we were never there in that place. Well, that's the idea. Tony Evans said it this way. He said, God has provided the Jews with supernatural deliverance from those who hated them, but the people had to fight. They couldn't merely sit back and do nothing. By the way, that's true of us as believers. Uh, we have to, we're called to be in the spiritual battle, not to sit on the sideline, not to take it easy, but we're called to serve the Lord. We're called to live for him, live out that, uh, the life of Christ in our lives. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 and 4, through five, it says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh, for our weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. We are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God, and we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. What's the point here? The point is that we are in the battle, and our battle it's not against flesh and blood. It's not against your, your cohort in, in, at work who's giving you a hard time. It's not against your boss. It's not against your fellow classmate who hates you and despises your faith. The battle's against the, the evil one. But God gives us the power to face that battle if we're walking with him. David had to take up his slingshot. Remember that? He had to take up his slingshot. But what did he say to Goliath? He says, it's over for you, bud. Because he says, and the reason it's over for you is because God is going to take you out. This is the Morgan translation. God is going to take you out to prove to everyone that there is a God in Israel. He said, the battle's not mine. It's the Lord's. I think that was true in Mordecai and Esther's time. And listen, the fact that the Jews... In other parts of the empire, killed 75,000 in one day. Shows how many people, nonetheless, hated the Jews, even though the edict had been written. Basically told them, look, treat the Jews with favor. And so since the Jews were greatly outnumbered in the empire, their victory was certainly a tribute to their courage, faith, yes, but also to the power of God. On their behalf. Supernatural intervention, we would say. Now, let's read on. It says, The king said to the queen Esther, The Jews have uh, killed and destroyed 500 men and 10 sons of Haman at the citadel of Susa. What then have they done in the rest of the king's provinces? And we read that a minute ago, just, just a minute ago. Let's go to verse 13. Then said Esther, If it pleases the king, let tomorrow also be granted to the Jews who are in Susa to do according to the edict of today. And let Haman's ten sons be hanged on the gallows. Take note of that. So the king commanded that it should be done and an edict was issued in Susa. And Haman's ten sons were hanged. The Jews, were, the Jews who were in Susa assembled also on the 14th day of the month of Adar, or Adar and killed 300 men in Susa, but they did not lay their hands on the plunder. Now the rest of the Jews were in the king's provinces assembled to defend their lives and rid themselves of the, their enemies and killed 75,000 of those who hated them, but they did not lay hands on the plunder. Now, some commentators again have seen Esther's request in verses 12 and 13 as a bit bizarre. The question is, why would she ask to have the bodies of Haman's sons hanged? They didn't hang them. They actually kind of poked them and put them on a stick. Uh, Why would she do that? Why would she request that? that? Isn't that a bit over the top? Doesn't that show that she's vindictive, that she's angry, that she's hostile, that she's bitter? And I say, no, not. It does not. You see, Haman's strongest support was in the city of Susa. And by hanging the bodies of Haman's son, it would be an act to deter those who would entertain the thought of killing the Jews. Esther, in a sense, was saving lives of her Hebrew people and and even many Persians. Remember this. 
And this is what brings me to this conclusion. The author of the book of Esther has consistently portrayed Esther as a paragon of wisdom, which in my opinion supports the view that her request in verse 13 was motivated by a desire to help the Jews not to get revenge on, on the, her enemies and to put an end to bloodshed as much as she could at least. So here's what I would say about Esther. I would, instead of being a woman of bitterness, I would say that she was a woman without guile. A woman without guile. She was, and here she, and here's what I want you to get. God delivers. He smiles upon the guileless heart. The heart that's without guile. Now what is guile? Well, the dictionary, one dictionary puts it this way. It's insidious cunning in attaining a goal. It's crafty or artful deception, duplicity. And I would add, with evil intent. Romans 16, 18 says, For some, such men are slaves, not of the Lord Christ, but of their own appetites. By their smooth and flattering speech, they deceive the hearts of the unsuspecting. Now, that's the American standard. But the word there that's used is a kakos. A kakos. Now, take the alpha off the front, or the A, and you have kakos. And that word means guile those who have guile. When you put an alpha on the beginning of a Greek word, it negates it. It reverses it, in other words. So here it's saying, he says, they, uh, the un, they deceive uh, the, un, the, the people who are guileless. See, people who are guileless sometimes do not detect the guile in others. Remember that cliche, it takes one to know one? And some of those who are unsuspecting or guile, those who are guileless often become targets of those who are deceitful. Hebrews 7, 26 says, It was fitting for us to have such a high priest, holy, innocent. There's that word again. Without guile. And, um, undefiled, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. And the Septuagint, the trans, Greek translation again, of Job verse two, I mean, chapter 2, verse 3 says, The Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? For there is no one like him on the earth, a blameless, there's that word again, alpha, with the alpha on the front, kakos, without guile, an upright man, fearing God, turning away from evil, and he still holds fast his integrity, although you incited me against him to ruin him without cause. Even Job here points out was a man without guile. I really think that if you want God to smile on you, that you have, if you've trusted Christ, of course it begins there. It begins with trusting Christ. All this won't work unless you've trusted Christ as your Savior. You've given your, allowed Him to become your Savior. But all this is saying is that we need to rid ourselves of vindictiveness. We need to keep short accounts. Rid ourselves of vengeance. Uh, over the years and many, many hours of counseling, I am convinced that this is where often where the believer loses the ball, drops the ball, fumbles the ball, and, there, and loses the, the joy of their salvation, the joy of, 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 of personal fellowship with Christ. It's, they allow bitterness and vindictiveness to control them. I've seen people go in and out of the hospital who had real ailments. But I'm convinced that they had them because of their bitterness. There's a great story told about Leonardo da Vinci when he was working on The Last Supper. You know that picture. And it was, came up to a point where he was actually working on the face of Jesus. And for some reason he became angry with a fellow person, friend, whatever. And he just lost it, unloaded on the guy. Well... Then later he went back to the, his canvas. He's working on the face of Jesus. And he could not. He could not work on the face of Jesus. He just he finally put down his brush and went out and found the guy and asked for his forgiveness. 
that's a great illustration of, of our fellowship with God. We can, we can know Christ, we can have him as our Savior, but we can allow stuff in our lives that would so intervene and so keep us from walking in fellowship with him and enjoying that, that John 15, of the vine and the branches, experiencing the joy of Christ. Now, let's read on in verse 17. It says, this was done on the 13th day of the month of Adar, Adar, and on the 14th day they rested and made it a day of feasting and rejoicing. But the Jews who were in Susa assembled on the 13th and 14th of the same month, and they rested on the 15th day and made it a day of feasting and rejoicing. The reason they have different days that they're resting is because, remember, Esther asked for an extension to, for the Jews to be able to defend themselves because the fear was is that the Jews, some people in the outer regions, out of the outer provinces, would not get word, and they would, thus the fighting would go on for another day. So that's what, what that, all that means. Now, verse 19, says, Therefore the Jews of the rural areas who live in the rural towns make the 14th day of the month of Adair a holiday for rejoicing and feasting and send portions of food to one another. Now, what you really see here is rejoicing. You see them celebrating victory, right? Deliverance, no doubt, had brought all this about. When God delivers us, we rejoice, right? When, he ta- when we get through to the, the, the trial, the difficulty, whatever it is, we rejoice, right? But I want you to see something closer here, something that's it's reiterated, recapitulated. The word rest, R E S T. In the Hebrew, it's nuah, and it means to rest in place, to be settled. It was used uh, often to speak of a, can, a camel that would be placed on and we, we cause him to rest. What would he do? He would get on his knees, doesn't he? That's the idea. Beyond the legitimate rest here, I think the, the author is talking, I mean, what we see here in this context, it really presents a picture to us of the Christian life. You've heard me talk about this many times. When the believer has placed his faith in Christ and lives in dependence upon him, the Bible tells us that there is a rest that remains. And he gives a description in Hebrews as if it's like going into a room. It's entering something, like entering an event. I want us to go to Hebrews chapter 4 and just highlight some of these passages. And again, I realize for some, this is familiar territory, but again, it's important. Now, the context, uh, what's going on in the, in, the, uh, with the, in the book of Hebrews? Well, I think this is speaking to the book of Hebrews, is speaking to believing Jews, but who have gone back, who desire to go back into the old sacrificial system. Now, why is that? Well, the Jews believe that the Messiah would give them rest. Once the Messiah came, would, it, 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 he would give them rest. But now they find themselves facing persecution, facing tribulation. And so they're thinking, well, wait a minute. In the Old Testament, I, we were told that if you face tribulation and persecution, that that was a sign of God's dishonor of you. Sign of God's, you know, saying not, just being displeased with us. Of course, in the New Testament, persecution, tribulation can be a sign of God's refining process, sign of God's blessing, sign of God's hand upon us. But they didn't see that. They didn't understand that. And so many of them were beginning to forsake their faith and go back to the sacrificial system. And what does the author of Hebrews, and we're, again, that's a debate as to who it is, the author of Hebrews says, no, 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 there's a rest that still remains. Now, in Hebrews chapter 4, and by the way, uses the people wandering in the wilderness and going into the land of Canaan. And the land of Canaan is not, in this context, is not a picture of heaven. Though that'd be a great picture, wouldn't it? But that's not what he's talking about here. He's talking about a rest that remains for the believer in that day and time that also remains for each of us. Now let's read, pick it up in verse 1. We're just going to spot read some verses here. 
It says, therefore, therefore, in light of the, the people who wandered in the wilderness and who did not believe in trust God and who were left out in the wilderness, he says, therefore, let us, say it with me. What? Fear. Fear, I thought we weren't supposed to have fear. It says, let us fear if while a promise remains of entering his rest, any one of you may seem to come short of it. Now the phrase come short of it in the Greek could be come late, fall off. So what is he saying? He's saying the only time that we need to have fear, you have anxiety, you have worry, no. He says the only time you need to have fear is when you fail to enter his promise. I'm mean, enter his faith, rest, life. Enter his room of rest. Huh. The word rest in the Greek is kata, pauses. It comes from the, the, the verb form is pao. It's made of two words. Kata means down. Pauses means to cease. Cease work. So it, it before we get the word pause, right? But it's a compounded word, and when he puts this, the, the kata on the front of it, it intensifies it. He could have just used the word pao and say, cease doing what you're doing. But here he puts uh, added emphasis on it to, again, emphasize the word. In my mind's eye, again, using the athletic illustration, it pictures someone who comes to the sideline after they've been playing for a while, and they... Most of them go and sit, but let's, some of them come and they kneel on their knee, one knee at least, and watch what's going on. They're resting. Could be in volleyball, girl, girls' volleyball or soccer. Does, could be in any, any athletic event, but what do they do? Sometimes they come to the sideline and they kneel. That's the picture that's given here. So here's number three. Here's how God delivers. He gives rest to the delivered heart. He gives rest to the delivered heart. Heart. Matthew 11, verses 28 through 30 says, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you what? Rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now that passage is often used in the context of salvation, one coming to Christ. But it also has an application to the believer who's walking with Christ. Isaiah 26, verses 3 and 4 says, The steadfast of mine you will keep in perfect peace, because he trusts in you. Trust in the Lord forever, for in God the Lord we have an everlasting rock. I've noticed over the years, going through airports, that sometimes you come upon this place, and there's a room, and there's a sign above it. It says, chapel and you think here in the hustle and bustle of the of the airport where people are going nuts or going fast and here's a room that says chapel and you think why is that there well the people at the airport who make build those airports realize that many people come carrying a lot of baggage not just physical baggage but emotional baggage hurt and pain and they need to stop sometimes. Some come grieving, having either on their way to a funeral or coming back from a funeral. So they go into the room, and there's quiet, and there's peace. I want to say that's the picture of the believer who learns how to enter rest in the midst of the storm. Who learns how to rest. How do you say, well, how do I do that? I'd love to enter that room of rest. Well, it's very simple. He gives us outline right here. He says, they fail to enter while the promises remain what? In other words, they remain left out. The average believer, the average believer, and this is a sad note, but the average believer cannot quote you 15 promises in God's word in their addresses. That's sad. When I was in college, someone put that to me, and I thought, wait a minute, that's not true. And then I couldn't think of, I couldn't, remember, I couldn't call, recall 15 promises. <laughs> I thought, so I started a promise notebook. 
Right in the middle, I had three columns, a big column in the middle. The address on, on the left-hand side, the verse written out, and then on the right-hand side, the purpose, normal Christian life, prayer, evangelism. And I begin to go through that book over and over. You claim the promises of God, and you enter his rest. So, what do we learn today? What's the first one? God does what? He exalts the what? Pure and... Okay, good. What's number two? Number two, what is it? He smiles on the what? Say it out. Say it one more time. Okay, smiles on the, the guileless heart. And thirdly, what is it? He gives rest, right, to the delivered heart. So let me give you some applications here for it to take home with you. Process your anger biblically. Process your anger biblically. Say, so well, how do you do that? Well, and some might even say, well, look, the Bible says be angry and sin not. Well, I, can't we be angry? Yes, we can. Anger in itself is not a sin. But it, that Greek text is what we call a permissive imperative. A permissive imperative means when you are angry, do not sin. In other words, the arousal of anger is not sin, but when it arouses, I've got to deal with it. I've got to confess it. Give it to the Lord. Move on. Secondly, remember the Lord is your avenger. Romans 12, 19, which is a quote out of Deuteronomy 35, says what? Vengeance is whose? Who's mine? Who is that? God, right? When we claim vengeance, we're on God's property. We're trespassing. God puts the sign that says, stop. no trespassers. Hmm. Thirdly, remember, God often chooses to deliver through the storm, many times, not out of the storm. Hmm. If you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, whether you're here today or watching online, or shall watch online, let me say that first, all this will not make any sense. But Christ died on the cross in my place, in your place, that our sins might be paid for. Oh, we, with the hands of faith, reach out and accept Christ as our Savior. We acknowledge that we are, we're sinners. We've missed God's mark, and we need a Savior. And the only way that we can get to heaven, as the Bible says and as Jesus says, is through Him. If you understand that, then the next step is learning how to live the Christian life what I call the normal Christian life, step by step, moment by moment, and a big part of that is learning how to enter into God's rest, having a pure, humble heart. And that's a process for all of us, and I haven't arrived there as well. No one has. And even today, I, there are times when I, I, I'm thinking in the flesh and not in the spirit. And so we all kind of struggle with that. So keep that in mind. But he, this, is the, this is how God delivers. Let's pray.